For more than 150 years, residents and visitors to Perry Park, Colorado have traveled across this enchanted land under the watchful eye of the great Indian chief Tumpakitas. Legends tell how this mighty leader was turned to stone by the prophet Mokana, who condemned the tribal leader to stand guard over this land he once ruled. In the distance, Wa'unu cries a fountain of tears over the fate of her petrified lover. Her mournful wail can be heard in the waterfalls of Mu'aga Canyon. Their lives are held in a state of never-ending torment until the day they are released from their water and stone prisons when they will once again rule the foothills of Plum Creek. This is Perry Park, a hidden enclave on the outskirts of Douglas County, a beautiful and mysterious land with a rich history of colorful characters, Indian folklore, and the dreams of dozens of entrepreneurs and schemers who would turn this quiet outpost into a thriving community. Before the 19th century, Perry Park was a sacred place for many Indians that roamed its open meadows and rock-covered hills and ravines. Kiowa, Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Utes made their camps along the banks of Plum Creek and in the shadows of the towering pine trees. During the westward expansion of the early 1800s, the white man began to encroach on the Indians' territory. One of the first documented expeditions was by famed explorer Stephen Harriman Long. Long's expedition explored the southern portion of the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. Thus, in 1820, their first major obstacle was getting across this vast expanse, which Mr. Long coined it the Great American Desert. They were to find the headwaters of some of the major creeks and rivers, mainly the Platte. And of course, one of the first major things they found was the uh, exit of the falls up at Waterton Canyon. Long's party followed Plum Creek. They journeyed on down to the inlet to what is today's Perry Park. As the West began to open up, settlers eventually followed the trail blazed by Long. Most were men, but by 1858, Sarah Coberly had opened a halfway house for travelers. As the area's first non-Indian woman, she created a rest stop that quickly earned a reputation for friendly conversation and comfortable accommodations. Friday, 24th, reached Mrs. Coberly's. 35 miles from Denver at 8 p.m. This is the well-known and best house of entertainment, perhaps on the whole route. An excellent supper, comfortable sleep, kind attention quite refreshed me. Most of the settlers to the area came from the East Coast and beyond. Many came from England. They were drawn by the lure of gold and silver, and all dreamed of building a new life in the rugged foothills of the Rocky Mountains. This is a quote from Artist Webb's book, The Perry Park Story. By that time, the area was being rapidly homesteaded. Among those preceding Perry into the area were Peter Brannan, D.I. Kramer, Alan Dakin, James Gott, N.S. Grout, Alfonso Jar, Chris Manhart, Ben Quick, George Ratcliffe, and Upton T. Smith. These hardy souls came in the 1860s, perhaps originally to mine, but when Douglas County yielded no valuable claims, they turned to ranching, dairying, lumbering, and quarrying. Mining for gold or silver was what brought me, as well as many others who came to Colorado in those days. After seven months in that mining camp, I was convinced that the goddess of fortune would not smile on me, so I decided to come down to the valley, take up a homestead, and build a house. 
The men who made Perry Park their home were rugged and independent. They built their homes out of rough-hewn logs and mud. They were as tough as a ten-year-old saddle. But they dreamed of building a life they could share with that special gal. Of course, the women weren't always quick to take to life in the mountains of Colorado. Many of the early settlers were gentlefolk from the old country, and while the free and easy life was rather a novelty to the men, it was very hard on the women, who had none of the conveniences to which they were accustomed. One Englishman remarked, it was heaven for the men, but hell on the women. Although it was dangerous country, the settlers enjoyed a country so beautiful, so healthful, that it was said the only way to start a cemetery was to kill or hang a man. One of the settlers who gained prominence in the area was Benjamin Quick. Quick was a man of spirit and conviction. His home was solidly built of rhyolite stone and surrounded by an eight-foot tall fence, creating a virtual fortress. Nearby settlers often took refuge in Quick's compound during the frequent Indian raids. During the raids of 1868, the stockade on Quick's property became known as Fort Washington. When we arrived at the fort, Quick's house was crowded with people that had come from their homes. No one had gone to bed as no one knew where to make their beds to sleep. Several narrow escapes were the talk of the men those exciting times. The stock had to be neglected. The cows milked on Monday evening and were not milked again until Friday afternoon. The men were after the Indians, and the women had no way to go to their homes to care for the stock. The Indians killed some people, but mostly took horses. Obviously, the settlers were moving in on Indian land, and the Indians were trying to dissuade them from this. Quick's influence shaped the valley in many ways. He donated land for the cemetery and the area's first school the Glen Grove Schoolhouse, which was used until the 1950s. In 1869, Ferdinand Hayden explored the Colorado Territory as part of another major geographical survey. In his logs, Hayden called the area Pleasant Park. Hayden was accompanied by renowned artist and photographer William Henry Jackson. Jackson captured much of the area's unique scenery on canvas and in photographs. The rose-colored rock formations in the hills overlooking Plum Creek soon became a favorite subject for Jackson. A few years later, in 1872, a wealthy railroad man, John Dietz Perry, purchased 4,000 acres of Pleasant Park. He built several ranch buildings at the foot of a large rock. He later named the rock Nanashunt. Among his acquisitions in the area, Perry purchased Sarah Coberley's halfway house. He eventually expanded the house and brought his family out west. While his wife found life in the Rockies too rugged for her tastes, Perry quickly earned a reputation as a generous host who loved to entertain and as a man who enjoyed an elegant lifestyle. They were very gregarious people. They enjoyed having visitors. They entertained Isabella Beard, the remarkable Englishwoman who rode alone through the Rockies in the early 1870s. Snow began to fall not in powder, but in heavy flakes. Finding that there would be risk in trying to ride until nightfall, in the early afternoon, I left the road and went two miles into the hills by an untrodden pass, where there were gates to open and a rapid, steep-sided creek to cross. And at the entrance to a most fantastic gorge, I came upon an elegant frame house belonging to a Mr. Perry, a millionaire, to whom I had had an introduction, which I did not hesitate to present, as it was weather in which a traveler might almost ask for shelter without one. Mr. Perry was away, but his daughter, a very bright-looking, elegantly-dressed girl, invited me to dine and remain. They had stewed venison and various luxuries on the table, which was tasteful and refined, 
and an Atroid colored table maid waited, one of five attached Negro servants who had been their slaves before the war. One of the landmarks which still remains from uh, John D. Perry's time is the rock that is uh, almost next to Sentinel Rock on the golf course. It has a cave, a shallow cave, but a cave. And it's covered with initials, carvings of people who have stopped there. And I had always been told that it was a stagecoach stop, dating back to the early 1870s, perhaps earlier, going back to the Coberly House, which was a, a stage stop. By now, Pleasant Park was known as Perry Park, and John Perry and his son Charles had built a successful ranching operation. His son Charles took to the ranching life. He really enjoyed it, apparently, by all accounts. And he worked here, ran the ranch, until tragically he was uh, hit by, a, he was kicked by a horse. And he died shortly thereafter, which was a great tragedy because not only did John Deets Perry lose his son, he lost his very, very efficient ranch manager. After the death of his son and partner, John Perry faced the difficult task of running the ranch by himself. His wife had taken to spending winters back in St. Louis. The loss of his son and his wife's distaste for life on the ranch eventually caused Perry to sell his spread. It would be the beginning of a chain of events that would permanently shape the future of Perry Park. Unfortunately, it didn't sell very fast, but a group of people formed the Redstone Town Land and Mining Company. Redstone Town Land and Mining Company was run by General Bella Hughes, a Denver Pacific Railroad man. With John Perry as a principal investor, they decided to rebuild Perry Park as a tourist destination. In the summer of 1889, they opened a hotel called Nanishant, an Indian word for echo. The Denver Times wrote of their project, their plan is to attract people of culture and refinement who wish to retreat from the hum, bustle, and worry of social and business cares. They built a dam across Bear Creek to form Lake Wakanda, and the surrounding area was dubbed the village of Lake Wakanda. They had some grandiose ideas. They, they were going to have a railroad line come into Perry Park from, you know, the east. They were going to have a casino, a museum, and a library. They hired Frederick Law Olmsted, the famous designer of New York Central Park, to plan their village. I guess I should say the higher-toned people would live around the lake, and the lesser people or the business people would live down towards the front of the park. But they had it all planned out. It's a haven of rest a breathing place on the wayside of life that we need in this hurry and rush of the 19th century. Here, amid the odor of the pine trees and the fragrance of the wildflowers that deck the lawn before your cottage door, you find rest. Far from the maddening crowd, far from the world of fashion, far from the rush of business with its hurry and to and fro, far from the ring of the telephone with its imperative hello. Their sales pitch included an elaborate retelling of an Indian legend of a great warrior who had been turned to stone. According to the Indian historian, their people were always. A tradition among the Indians makes this the home of the earliest race of man. In the beginning of time, they were giants and giantesses who reigned supreme over the land. This all-powerful people too soon refused to acknowledge the power of Gichi Manito, the master of life, who sent them warning words of counsel, but they would not heed. At last, a prophet, the great Mokana, came to help them, but they would not listen to his words of wisdom. As they stood about him, with their war paint and gaudy weapons, suddenly, the wrath of their god came upon them, 
and all living things were instantly stone images of their former selves. And they built their village in the shadows of the giants, now frozen for eternity, who had once held absolute domain over a valley now being sold by the acre to wealthy tourists. This is a brochure that was prepared by the Redstone Town Land and Mining Company when they were trying to develop Perry Park as a resort area. It has a number of photographs by William Henry Jackson, the really famous pioneer photographer of the whole Rocky Mountain area. This booklet tells of some Indian legends, which may or may not be true. They may have been devised by the developers, the would-be developers, to romanticize Perry Park, to give names to the unusual rock formations, to develop a kind of uh, enchanting legend of Indians turned to stone and weeping maidens symbolized by rocky uh, waterfalls, all of which is quite charming, but there is no historical definition or background for it. So one can believe or not believe. A general store was built near the east entrance to what they hoped would become the village of Perry Park. But as various plans to build railroads stalled, the rest of the proposed village never materialized. While they had hoped to build a railroad from either Larkspur or from Sedalia to Palmer Lake, the scheme proved too complicated to complete, and Perry Park quickly became a bottomless money pit. For John Perry and General Hughes, the curse that had befallen the Indian chief Tumpakitas now threatened to turn their plans into stone. And as they tried to solve their problems by selling out, the worst was yet to come. When they were trying to sell it, they had a lot of title problems. It turned out that John Perry really didn't have title to the very core of Perry Park. And when they tried to trace it back into the, uh, through county records, the land still belonged to the Indians. So there wasn't really any way they could get clear title. As the 19th century came to a close, Colonel William Hughes, a wealthy lawyer, banker, and cattleman, began purchasing stock in the Redstone Town Land and Mining Company. Colonel Hughes quickly installed himself as the company president. He was a very wealthy man, and probably a very shrewd man, too. He apparently realized that this um, whole title problem was causing the land to be seriously undervalued. By 1902, Hughes had gained clear title to the land owned by the Redstone Company. He had used a provision in a new law that granted ownership for those occupying land for more than 20 years. With the legal problem solved, Hughes purchased the remaining shares owned by Perry and other stockholders. In 1904, Colonel Hughes renovated the Nanashant Lodge. He changed the name to the Clifton Inn, naming it after his daughter who died that year. Hughes also ran a successful cattle operation on the surrounding land. Colonel William Hughes was quite popular. The neighbors liked him, and he had uh, uh, nice parties at the Clifton House. And uh, so he was really quite a, a popular man, and he also had a great deal of money, which helped to keep the place going. At the age of 72, Colonel Hughes sold his country estate to J. George Laner. With his turn at Perry Park complete, Hughes purchased Highlands Ranch and created another successful cattle company. In the meantime, George Laner was reshaping Perry Park yet one more time. George Laner was a, a very interesting man. He invented a, a water-cooled drill for miners 
And he apparently made a great deal of money with his inventions, and he ended up selling the company that he developed to Ingersoll Rand and decided he wanted to be a gentleman farmer. So George Lehner started to raise hogs in Perry Park. And I think there were a lot of neighbors who didn't like that too much, except that one good thing was that they destroyed all the rattlesnakes. Lehner closed the Clifton Inn, and while it was often used for parties and entertaining, it was never opened to the public again. Lehner's plan of being a gentleman farmer never really took hold. Again, Perry Park proved to be a massive financial drain. In 1918, Lena was forced to sell to Robert P. Lamont. He was kind of an exotic soldier of fortune type. He went off to fight in World War I in the Ambulance Corps, and he was awarded a medal by the French government. So apparently he was a very brave soldier. He came back after the war missing a hand and, and seriously wounded with shrapnel and so forth, but very interested in farming, and he came and bought Perry Park Ranch. He was married to a very beautiful woman who was an artist and a sculptor, and she had a studio in the manor house. And they were very prominent in Denver social circles. And they had cars, automobiles, and uh, it wasn't as remote, and they could go back and forth to Denver more easily. For almost 20 years, Perry Park thrived under the ownership of Robert Lamont. But the economic downturn brought on by the Great Depression eventually took its toll. In 1937, Lamont sold the old ranch that had been once owned by Benjamin Quick. Lamont sold the property to Reginald Sinclair, a wealthy investor from Colorado Springs. Later that year, Lamont sold the rest of Perry Park to Walter Pepke. Pepke was the owner of the Container Corporation of America. He and his wife used Perry Park as their summer home, while a hired foreman ran the ranching operation year-round. Pepke had a new guest house built and the original Perry home remodeled. They had lots of square dances and round dances in the barn. We'd have those dances about once a month, and it was for everybody in the area. We'd have them from Sedalia, from Franktown, from Parker, from Parma Lake. That barn was just, it was dancing itself. The Pepkeys eventually moved to Aspen and revitalized the sleepy mining town into an international resort. But for Perry Park, it meant another sale and another change in direction. In 1951, when Pepke moved to Aspen, he sold Perry Park to a man named Boyd Cousins, who was a furniture manufacturer from the Midwest. <clears throat> and one of the things that um, changed radically under Boyd Cousins was that he closed it off, closed off the ranch, and did not allow people to come in as they had in the past. It just apparently began to drive him crazy because there was a lot of litter, there was a lot of noise, and the people were not respecting the private property. And so he just built gates and closed it all off, which did not make him very popular, but <laughs> it was his property. For the first time in its history, Perry Park was closed to the public. Among his intentions, Boyd Cousins hoped to preserve the natural beauty of Perry Park, but he also intended to protect his investment by creating a self-sustaining ranching operation. He raised quarter horses and Hereford cattle. He also considered subdividing the property, but was worried that too would ruin the natural beauty of the area. Boyd Cousins successfully operated his ranch in Perry Park for more than 15 years. But as his health began to fail, Perry Park was once again put on the market. In 1967, Lee Stubblefield took control of Perry Park. Lee was a Air Force colonel, and he was stationed at uh, Lowry Field in Denver. One time, I guess he was in a T-33, and he was flying down towards Colorado Springs, and he happened to fly over Perry Park. 
and he, he was amazed at the beauty of the place. And he was getting close to retirement, and I think he wanted to get in the development business. So uh, after he saw that beautiful piece of land that he flew over, he started looking into it and found out uh, who had owned it. And Well, Lee was a good promoter, and he started to form partnerships, both general and limited partnerships, to raise the money to purchase Perry Park. He started to try to develop it and had really, really wonderful plans. He had a great dream, as many people before him had. He was going to develop a virtually perfect community with a golf course, a tennis court, swimming pools, a lake for boating, underground utilities, acres of green belts, wonderful plans. Stubblefield also had a wonderful idea for building this Echo Hills Club, which stands on Inspiration Point and overlooks all of Perry Park. It was a really stunning building. There was a beautiful cocktail area, huge windows overlooking the golf course, virtually all of Perry Park, a large dining room, meeting rooms downstairs. It was really a, a lovely place. And in the early days, we all used it and all enjoyed it. Uh, it was called the Echo Hills Club, which kind of reflects the name of the original Nanashant Hotel, which was also called Hotel Echo. Lee Stubblefield formed the Colorado Western Development Company. The development built roads and planned what they hoped would be the perfect suburban community. By 1974, almost 200 homes had been built, with nearly a thousand more on the drawing board. Perry Park was on its way to becoming the community that John Perry and the Redstone Group had envisioned in 1889. But as financial problems began to plague Lee Stubblefield, those promises began to unravel. The golf course remained unfinished, power lines were never buried, and the lakeside development was never completed. There was a group formed by the Perry Park residents called the Perry Park Landowners Association, and we tried to work with Stubblefield to get him to keep some of the promises that were made in the brochures, the things that we all believed were, were going to happen. The Homeowners Association took Stubblefield to court. After their initial victory, the association faced several more years of appeals by Stubblefield's attorneys. In the meantime, the homeowners had taken it upon themselves to finish the golf course and sold bonds to finance the preservation of Lake Wauconda. After several years of appeals and legal maneuvering by Stubblefield and his attorneys, the Metro District of Perry Park finally faced the reality they would never see any of the millions of dollars originally awarded by the courts. We could have appealed the appeal and uh, sued again, but it would have gone on and on, and, and we just felt that uh, we shouldn't be spending tax money, and it was really a tough decision. But we kind of, in effect, gave up at that point and said, okay, we'll do it all ourselves. Lee Stubblefield sold much of his property to an industrial developer from Louisiana, Raymond Juro. Initially, the change of ownership brought renewed hopes of positive changes for Perry Park, but like so many before him, Raymond Juro couldn't deliver on the dream of an ideal mountain community. People thought maybe he was the savior, that he was gonna bail us out of all our troubles, but uh, we were disabused of that quite rapidly. He uh, said he bought Stubblefield's assets. He didn't buy all the things that were wrong. And he was not going to pay to have all these things fixed. He was only buying the assets. Gerald evicted the country club from the manor house. And when he tried to circumvent a 99-year lease on the golf course, the residents found themselves back in court. Perry Park was pretty much known as the place where we're always in court. And this happened over and over for quite a few years. A woman who had purchased some of Raymond Jurrell's assets claimed ownership of the course and again tried to negate the long-standing lease. Again, after an appeal, the residents won their case. So this year, we actually own the golf course for the first time. 
through all this thick and thin, we came through again. So it's just been uh, a saga. <laughs> Probably people will come here in 20 or 25 years and they won't know anything about all these trials and tribulations. They'll just think, oh, isn't this a pretty place to live? But we fought for it. Through all the trials and tribulations, the beauty and allure of Perry Park remains. Perry Park is a special place that evokes dreams. From the very first visit, you can imagine the possibility of a utopian village hidden from the rest of the world by towering pine trees and high fences of scrub oak. But decades of broken promises from men who saw themselves as giants are a reminder that Perry Park is an enchanted land, protected by the vigilant Indian prophet Mokana. And just as he turned the warrior Tumpakitis into stone for allowing pride and ego to cloud his judgment, the Indian prophet chief has been quick to curse any man who would bring discourse to the mystic valley of Perry Park. On the hills above the valley, iconic stones that entomb the spirits, the Indian warriors of another time watch over this land they once ruled, waiting waiting for the day when they will be set free to the joy and gladness of a new life in this garden of the Rockies.